Hello everybody and welcome to uh, our furry art school uh, art lecture studies uh, streaming art lectures by Iothisk. That's my name, Iothisk. I'm in the fandom and uh, yeah we're gonna learn some color theory today. So uh, I'm gonna preface this, preface this, however you want to say it, uh, by saying that I'm drawing heavily from uh, a booklet a kind of booklet written by a comic book artist, and you can't really get this anywhere because it was part of a a, a one-time kind of art lecture study thing he did, which was pretty cool. We uh, we had an opportunity to sit and talk with him over sti over over Skype. Uh, if you don't know who Brian Stelfries is, he is an award-winning uh, comic book artist and colorist, uh, and his booklet here is called Painted Comics and Storytelling. Uh, I, it's, it's not a book, I don't think, uh, he might, he has lots of, like, different comic books out, so definitely look him up, all of his work is amazing, like, if you just type his, you know, name into a, into a Google search, you'll see the guy, uh, he, he knows his stuff backwards and forwards, and so I'm gonna be drawing on, uh, the, this, this booklet and, uh, and some notes I took from, uh, the the session and the and the course and of course my own uh, studies on color theory. So all right, with that uh, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and begin. Uh, first off, so uh, in addressing color theory, uh, we have to address first off uh, our blacks and our whites and our shades of gray. Um, we the reason that we have to start off with uh, with the blacks and whites and the shades of gray, uh, is because the that that is the primary thing that the eye is geared towards, and we'll talk a little bit about eye biology later. Uh, but whenever whenever you have like in general, color problems can sometimes be broken down to black and white problems. So let me show you let me show you something here. This is a, this is a little trick I can kind of start out with. So I am going to put on a correction layer, and you're not going to be able to see this, but hang on, you will see the effects. All right, um, I'm going to put on a saturation correction layer, and I'm going to apply it. And when I apply it, you will see that this rainbow that we had here disappeared. Well, what the heck happened there? Well, you should recognize that all of these colors of the rainbow are of the exact same value. We've got this value scale right underneath here for comparison, right? When we take color away, psh, whoa, all of the distinction between the colors disappears, and we just have this extremely middle gray. So that that's a gray that's probably right here-ish on the on the color value scale, and so what's so what's good about uh, throwing on a, a correction layer? This is a correction layer in in Clip Studio Paint. There are ways to do it in Photoshop as well. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna be speaking mainly mainly to that as far as uh, color work goes. But in general, if you've got a, a problem of of color. Uh, with like a rainbow and you're using like all bright colors and so forth and and things tend to blur and and nothing seems like super distinct it's probably because they're all of the same value when it comes down to it in black and white at the end of the day so I th this is this is a nifty trick to throw on any color work if you're if you imagine that you have some color problems throw it in black and white first uh, and and the shades of gray and the the values that that come out of that uh, if you can differentiate those as much as possible it helps make your color work a bit more uh, interesting because you're you're not only value you're not only changing up the hue of the thing by using the six or seven you know uh, main colors but you're also changing up the black and white value on the value scale so yeah that's a nifty little trick that you can do, and it and it kind of emphasizes why uh, black and white and shades of gray are super important in color theory. Because when you've got big, big old blobs of color here, they don't, uh, they 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 can kind of blend together as far as like uh, importance goes, and you have to control that. 
with uh, with your black and white and shades of gray. All right, so that's that's the value scale. All right, uh, from here I'm uh, I'm gonna read just uh, just from from uh, from some of the book here, or from some of the booklet or whatever. Uh, it is massively important for an illustrator to gain both skill and comfort working in black and white. In this stage, an artist can solve well over 80% of all picture and page problems. This is both the birthplace of ideas and where uh, the ether of thought becomes tangible. I like the way that he speaks there. Um, but yeah, so sketch on paper every day, uh, establish a value scale, use black and white and the shades of gray accordingly. Uh, if you master those first, uh, the splashes of color on top of that uh, are just are just icing on the, on the cake, really. So the way Brian Stillfries breaks breaks this down is that he uh, he goes through the the layout, and so I'll kind of I'll come in here and uh, I'll make a new layer of of this stuff. Uh, let me put these in kind of a folder to organize them. All right. So I'm going to turn the values of that down just a bit so that we can kind of see that we can kind of work on top of it a little bit. So I'm turning that down. All right. And coming in right here, I'm going to be using some, let's see here, I'm going to be using a rough inker brush uh, to, to kind of uh, focus on layouts. Uh, and and also some uh, some storytelling because one of the things that um, that I I'm, I'm kind of sidelining storytelling in here uh, as a, as a, as a, as an addendum to color theory we want to use our colors to make the most important parts of our work stand out uh, because what's um, and and again I'll get into this a little bit later but things things that fail to stand out do not have a viewer's undivided attention. So in layouts uh, are about create are not about uh, creating beautiful illustrations but they're more about solidifying ideas. So whenever you're laying out something to begin with just putting it in a basic sketch. Give me just a minute. I'm donning my art glove. All right. So say that we've got you know, like a, a page that we're going to lay out, right? Say that we're laying out, in this specific instance, a comic book page or something like that. We want to make sure that we decide like where our characters are, what our panels look like, uh, what our characters are doing at any given point in time, the stuff that's going on in the background maybe. We got to make a whole bunch of decisions beforehand. And the the reason that we're that we're laying out the the where, where color theory comes into this is that we have to take account of what all of our uh, decisions up to this point have been, right? So what's so this this character is an important part of what's going on here in this one. Over here we might have a different character and something else is going on in the background. Over here uh, we've got uh, something like maybe something more important is going on. Uh, or maybe something less important is going on, and we'll just draw like a single person, and there'll just be like room for like word balloons or whatever. Say like if we're laying out a comic book, but yeah, it's best to uh, plan everything out how to out ahead of time, and in in your sketching stage, you can kind of uh, you can kind of note where shadows and stuff are going to be beforehand. Uh, kind of uh, laying out how things will look from a light and shading perspective and then that will help uh, inform your color as well but yeah so this is the stage where uh, you can choose like a title of the page or divine and uh, or uh, excuse me decide define an emotion of the illustration so you got uh, you got stick figures and, and mannequins, you know, that's it's not necessarily, you know, anything of like massive interest here, but it doesn't have to be yet. Cause you're just laying things stuff out. You're making uh 
you're making decisions about uh, what's going on All right, cool. We got kind of an kind of an idea going there. Anyway, uh, so that's that's a layout stage, if we're talking about that. And the next spot where where we where we really um, want to come in is we want to push the values a lot. And so since we're starting out on a white page, you can start out on a black page if you really want doesn't make a difference but since we're here we're starting out on a white page we'll want to decide where exactly uh, we want things light and dark so like if I'm just doing like a solid background or something like that I'm gonna do something really really dark and then maybe it'll fade to light and kind of a and kind of a gradient but we can decide we're making all of these decisions beforehand and we're doing what might be called spotting blacks we're just laying down spaces and one of the things this is this is kind of a cheap trick in art too like this is one of the ways that you can make uh, an unfinished work seem a lot more finished just by adding just by adding some black to one place adding in a gradient uh, you know or uh, or filling in a, a background with black you know, say that we wanted to do that around our character. Maybe there's something important there, like a light break. Could be like a door. You can think of a lot of different things here. You can think of uh, it's laying out uh, silhouettes. But basically, all you're doing is you're making decisions regarding your lights and your darks. So, and this is where some design can kind of come into play, right? Um, because you want to make sure that your that your shapes are strong, that your characters are strong, uh, that there's uh, a space for the attention to. Uh, there's a space for the attention to start, and there's a space for the attention to end, so to speak. Like, say that maybe we've got something of importance, like in the distance over here. And then there's going to be like kind of a a broad kind of lightning gradient, and so we've got our blacks. We can start it over here, and if we've got panels as far as comics goes, that'll make things a little bit a little bit more polished looking. But like we've got an area of light here, maybe instead of. Maybe instead of doing it that way, we'll get kind of a radiant thing going here. So, like, even right now, I'm not using anything, like, uh, super complicated, right? Like, I'm doing some basic, basic cross-hatching. But this can give us an idea of the choices that we've made when it comes to whatever we're uh, whatever we're drawing, whatever type of message we're trying to convey. And this will be similar, like for whether you're like if you're not doing a comic book page, this will be similar for drawing any like any one illustration. You know, any one of these panels could be blown out into a a full illustration all its own, right? And you'd still do the same thing. You'd have to make all of these decisions about where your characters are going to be, where your lights and shadows are going to be, where lights are going to come from. Yeah, and you can do some interesting design stuff, like maybe it starts out light here, change characters, things are a little bit mid-tone here, and then in here... We can emphasize the blackness and the emptiness. 
that a lonely figure is going off into the distance or something like that. But yeah, you know, it was a fun way to try multiple, you know, different layouts here. So I don't know exactly what's going on on this page necessarily. So you should, you should make a definite distinction going in there, like if you want to go for like a specific storytelling. But yeah, so you start out with your layouts, your sketches, and then you spot your blacks uh, and your grays, uh, and then where you go from there is is up to you really uh so but like once it's once it's uh, all said and done uh you've got decisions made about where your grayscale is going to be uh and then you've got decisions made about like what uh what colors you can use as well so all right with that let's break into color theory proper we can talk about color all right so it is safe to say that the human eyes can see over one million individual colors. And the key word here is individual. Uh, this is because the eyes are only capable of seeing a few colors at once. These few colors tend to fall into predictable groups. And color theory is understanding and application of these predictable groups. Okay. So you can see millions of colors, uh, and we'll move on to, to eye biology here, okay? So it's this is not going to be, you know, biology 101. This is another, you know, more borrowing from uh, uh, Brian Stelfreeze's pamphlet here. Uh, but yeah, so uh, covering just a bit of, uh, let's see here, a bit of a science topic. We've got, I'll turn this back down again and I'll throw another another layer on top of here all right so if we've got the human eye the human eye is a very simplistic understanding of it but you know so we've got a, a human eye and we've got kind of like a a cutout right here right and so we've got the inside of the eye which is hollow and it's filled with jelly-like substances but anyway the light comes through the pupil in our eye and hits the back wall of the of the retina and the retina is made up of tiny photosensitive cells called rods and cones Rods, yeah, let me fix, to, if I'm going to write here, I'm going to switch to a smooth one. Okay. Yeah, stabilization's too high. Rods and cones. Okay. So now the rods uh, form the majority of the cells, and they are sensitive to contrast and movement. So basically talking about the value scale. They're, va they're, they're sensitive to value, changes of value, changes of uh, light and movement. So contrast contrast and movement on the rod side and on the cone side, those are sensitive to color and detail. Color and detail. All right. Now, something that you should know, and this is going to be kind of a trick. This is going to be kind of a uh, an interesting shortcut to help solve many color problems. But the cones make up less than five percent. It is less than five percent of the total area of the retina. So what does that mean? That means that less than 5% of our vision is geared toward true color perception. And you have to keep that in mind because it's one of the rules that 
that ties color theory all together. All right. So, uh, given the location of the cones, so all of the all of the cones, right? So the rods are are pretty much like all over the eye, over here. The cones are specifically in this little section right here. In this back section right here. So it's only when we're directly focusing on something does the the information, the color information, get the most uh, attention from uh, from our eyeball from our eyeballs. Uh, and like all of the colors that fall outside of this, you know, become duller. You know, uh, the the example that Brian Stelfreeze uses in the book is that like if you if you take a look at your bookshelf, right? and you find a book with a bright blue spot, something like that, and you focus on that for a while. Try to notice what the other, other colors, uh, other brightly colored books, how their colors look. Because when you focus on that one blue book, the rest of the, the colors in your peripheral vision are kind of dulled down. So this is something that you can kind of practice and, and notice. So like, yeah. Well, yeah. So as soon as the viewer chooses a subject, the eyes and the brain work together to design a color theory around it. So the eyes, the sensation, and the brain perception work to work together to form a, a color theory. All right. So. Uh, one of the problems when it comes to uh, uh, real life, so to speak, uh, or like uh, photography, and I'm talking about like pure photography, not edited photography or anything like that. If you've just got a, a, a photograph and it contains a bunch of different colors, uh, and especially if they're of the same like value saturation, remember that trick we did turning things black and white, we lose our rainbow. Uh, when when we lose uh, when we lose our rainbow when we lose our our um, when we lose the the difference in in value uh, we don't control what the viewer of our artwork is looking at so this is all about uh, shifting focus and uh, controlling attention. Uh, and so if we want to control the attention for where the stuff falls, for where our, our, our viewers' eyes are going to go, we need to, make, uh, we need to make sacrifices in all sorts of areas, right? So if I say, for instance, if I say, for instance, I've got, I'm going to, well, I'm just going to, like, Value doesn't necessarily mean anything. I'm just going to use some like bright colors, right? So let's say that this is like a big red here, and then our character is going to have, you know, that distinctly bright blue shirt or something, right? And let's go ahead and throw like this is a yellow, a yellow head there. Say as a Simpsons character or something like that. Uh, you know, it's good. You've used different colors here, but keeping this uh, this trick from before, this uh, correction layer, so to speak. If I get, if I again turn that on, we've lost all depth to the image, right? That wasn't already established by these these black and white things right here, right? What is the color of anything in this image? It's that same dulled down gray that we saw in uh, in our in our folder right here, right? It's this same like oh gosh, just just it's a muddy gray color, you know. Uh, again, that's because we didn't make any significant difference in our values here. We used black and white to kind of mark stuff up, but then the color choices that we made uh, worked against those uh, those choices that we made before to lay stuff out in black and white before. So what what can we do to fix this? Well we can choose reds, we can choose colors 
that vary a bit. So let me take this entire color and instead of going over again I'll just kind of use the, the paint bucket here. Hopefully this is hopefully this will edit things right. Yeah, okay. So if we edit that color and then we edit our yellow color and we edit our blue color to be a slightly lighter thing, right? So we've changed stuff a bit and maybe our colors aren't as bright as before but we have made a clear decision as far as value. So let me throw on the value thing again and we can see that there's a bit more difference like here specifically there's a bit more difference. See I can, t I can tell like I didn't make enough difference here with this. So I can go back and tweak again. We're gonna make that even darker this time. And we're gonna make the blue a bit more desaturated or whatever. All right, we turn that on again. Great. And now we have a distinct uh, value difference in gray, right? So we've got like a light gray here, a super dark gray for the background, and kind of a uh, a muddy middle gray right there for our headspace or whatever. But because we used, you know, uh, yellow, it's it's bright and it stands out a lot more against this uh, this dull blue thing. So we kind of got a dull blackish thing here and a dull whitish blue here and a really uh, intense hue of yellow on the face, for example. So yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, it kind of reinforces you know what what kind of color choices we make as far as like the the tints and tones of our colors uh, and so uh, tint um, is is a is this when you're when you're talking about color theory specifically a tint of a shade is adding white to the pure hue and a tone is adding black to it that's kind of a special thing so if you're reading art books and you're reading about like tints and tones that's the that's the difference that we're talking about here. So we we have we have tints and tones that alter the value scale of our pure hues. So yeah. All right. Cool. And uh, yeah. So again, that's a way that we can uh, that we can uh, control attention, controlling attention as as we can see right there. All right. And now. We're going to talk about some of the governors, and uh, a couple of the governors. We're gonna we're gonna come back to this and uh, and turn that on again. I'm gonna turn these back back off, and so we will talk about our governors. All right. Uh, all right. Governors, there are just a few rules that you should follow, no matter what color schemes you decide to go with. And the rules form the base of color theory. And you have a strong base, and you can build strong color composition. Now, when I say always follow these rules, you know, this is these are these are rules that will set you up for success. You know, and and it's only once you really know the rules can you start to kind of break them intelligently, right? So uh, if you if you're like oh you know never never color an apple blue or whatever never use the color blue on an apple, you know because apples are not blue they're red or whatever, you know like okay yeah but there are certain light, lighting conditions that are gonna make that rule bend and break, so you know keep that in mind. So these are these are governors. So like hold hold fast to these rules especially when you're beginning learning color theory. But once you're a little more established, you can kind of play with them and break them up a little bit. Okay, so, number one, pick a subject. Pick a subject and represent it with a single pure color. Hmm. 
So, like, say what we've got, um, I, I've used up this panel already, so let's, let's go move on to this one. Uh, say, uh, maybe I don't like that, uh, the, the yellow color scheme so much, and I want this guy to be, uh, orange. So I'm going to use some orange here. Going to use some orange here. He's going to be our subject. He's going to be the center of our attention. And so he is going to be our purest color. Like all over his body. He's the main attraction. He's going to get a lot of the attention here. Right? So if we if we pick a subject and we represent it with a with a single pure color, uh, subject is uh, ideally less than five percent of the overall illustration. Uh, that's not what I did here, but we can kind of roll with this. Um, but this is where you want to concentrate the viewer's attention, right? He is the most important part of the image, and so he is going to be the primary color. So this this choice. Uh, pushes color into the realm of storytelling and makes it uh, characterizes the difference between cinematography and simply p picking colors that you think look good together. So we pick a subject and we represent it with a single pure color. All right. But uh, that doesn't seem quite done, does it? Well, we move on to governor number two. We're going to dominate an illustration or a page with a single color. Dominate page, or in this case, a panel. Uh, you know what? I'm going to take that back because if you're going to do this with an entire like comic page in mind, you don't want things discordant. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to take that back. I'm going to walk that back and say, dominate your page, and this is going to go whether you're, you know, doing just a single illustration or a comic book. You dominate a page with one single color. Alright, and you can think of this as the rule of ish. So, we've painted our guy orange. We've decided he's going to be, like, the rest of the colors are going to be orange-ish. So, we're going to choose... Maybe something a lot lighter for the background. Right? And uh, say, oh, hey, maybe we don't want this, you know, like a solid color. All right, fine. We're, we can move it up a bit, even. We can move it even more uh, towards white and do another thing. Right, so we've still got a color theme, kind of a monochromatic color theme here. But we've distinguished the values by adding white to the orange. And you can do the opposite by adding black to the orange. So like we've got, say we wanted to do like, there's a little bit of a, a down here or whatever. Say there's like a, if this is a framed window, that would be incredibly poorly framed because it's a uh, tangent to the panel borders itself. But whatever. This is just a sketch. It works out right now. So we've got the super bright orange, and then we've got a dull orange, which becomes a brown. Uh, and then we've got a lighter and lighter orange outside. We follow governor number two and dominate the, the page. Uh, it has the effect of making your work easier for the viewer to recall and describe. And I was like, oh, my attention was right here on this guy because he was super important. He was made to look super important. And that makes our people happy. All right. All right, that's, uh, that's governor number two. Moving on to governor number three. All right. Uh, and say if we wanted to, to do this in this entire page this way, I could come back here and say, like, okay, I only want things to be, uh, 
based off of this color of orange, right? So I take this and I paint over my entire page with it a bit and say that I wanted to tie this together some. I could come back in here. Uh, I would turn the opacity down on my brush by quite a bit. And I can paint over this thing. And suddenly everything is tied together a little bit with that same... There we go. With that same bit of orange. And it helps unify the page a little bit, especially if you've, uh, if you've got a, a variety of other other colors used here. Alright. Sorry, I've gotten distracted. Alright. Uh, let's see here. Once again. Dominate the page. with semi neutral colors all right and this goes back to the to the rods and cone thing cones things you know 95% of the piece should be handled in neutralized or dull colors right because you only want because you you only want that that 5% of the eye to fall where you want it to fall. So you you pick a subject or two subjects if you want, you know, some some movement or whatever, right? So uh once we've got uh so if if you're if you're neutralizing a color in real life, uh uh if you're using uh pigment paints or whatever, uh you're you're mixing the the color that you've chosen with its opposite, right? You're mixing an orange with a blue, you're mixing red with a green. Uh, you're mixing uh, yellow with uh, purple. Um, but yeah. So you would neutralize your colors that way. And so, uh, but um, with, uh, and, and color mixing can work similarly in digital art. Like you can use, uh, if I'm laying down just a couple colors here for, for example, if I laid out kind of the, kind of a rainbow here, then we can use kind of a smudge or a blender to bring stuff together. Nah, that's not going to work. Uh, this is what we want, I think. Yeah, there we go. So we kind of smudge, bring those colors in together. You can kind of neutralize your yellow by using blue, right? Or you can neutralize your red by using yellow and neutralize the colors here, mixing those right there. And so the way that we've got this, the, the, this um, blender has taken into account the background too. And so you can see that we've got like our primary colors here pulled out into some secondary colors there. Uh, and, that, and that can happen uh, digitally. Um, but we might add some like uh, a bit of uh, darkness, a bit of boldness to these colors uh, by introducing their their pure hues. We can kind of bring it in here with like uh, here. I'll use this just as an idea. I'll bring in some green. And we'll bring in some actual purple. You know, to kind of strengthen them back up. So yeah, we can do that. Um, yeah, definitely experiment with uh, methods of like blending and and uh, uh, pulling, uh, blending together, neutralizing colors. Uh, uniting things in a color theme. That's a, that's another trick that I can show you uh, a bit later, I think. Yeah, I'll come back to that. All right. Uh, let's see here. Semi-neutral colors, right. 
Uh, so the more orange you add to the blue, the more neutralized it becomes. An absolute neutral is when you get to a point where the color is neither orange nor blue. Uh, if you continue uh, to add orange to this mixture, the color becomes a semi-neutral orange, which is going to be more like a brownish. It'll be kind of a brownish between the 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 blue and the and the orange here. Um, an easy translation when working on a computer is to think of a neutral color which contains cyan, magenta, and yellow all at once. Uh, so in in uh, color uh, in digital terms, can you see that? Can you see that? Oh, I guess you can't. Okay, but I've got uh, I've got my color settings up here, and each of these uh, each of the colors uh, has a uh, a value of red, green, and blue because we're operating digitally and right here if I'm if I'm gonna use a color picker or something like that right here it's gonna be uh, about so this kind of uh, dull dull gray that's gonna have uh, reds in the hundred fifties greens in the hundreds blues in the fifties you know so to speak the neutralized colors will have more of those other color elements in them so yeah uh, and the closer the percentages are to each other, the more neutralized the color becomes. So the rule also means that you can use a lot of gray and brown. Those are often neutralized colors, but whatever what what the neutralized colors are going to be are going to be a bit dependent on the other colors that you choose to put on your image. So yeah, all right. Dominate your page with semi-neutral colors, right? So we can come back in, and I'll go to, I'll go to four, and we got a fifth one here, so I'll have to move this somewhat, but number four, dominate, again with the domination, dominate shadows with a single color temperature. Shadows with a single color temperature. All right, I'll get in in uh, in here a little a little bit into like perhaps you've heard of warm and cool colors. Uh, so, you know, for for instance, we we can consider like, and this is. This is vaguely a, a a cultural thing. This is not, you know, 100% true across like all cultures or whatever. But you know, in uh, in the United States of America, you can generally think of red as a very warm color, or like orange as a very warm color. We can even think of yellow as a cool color. Uh, excuse me, as a warm color, right? And so, like this begins to look like a like a fire, so things are warm. And then on the opposite range, we've got greens and blues and purples that move into the realm of feeling cold. Right? If we've got a purple here, things feel a bit cold. It's an icicle in the darkness, you know, as opposed to a, a flame. Uh, that's casting light everywhere. So we got warm and and cool colors. That's what we're talking about when I'm talking about color temperature. So if you decided that your shadows are going to be warm, uh, you're going to want to use those those deep dark reds and and oranges and uh, kind of your kind of your muddy yellows or something like that. This could be an example of a muddy yellow. Looks kind of greenish, but then this green places it into context so you can think of that as like a muddy yellow and then this as a muddy orange or a brown and this you know as a as a muddy you know place like there so we can see that there's still colors right red orange yellow green uh, but they're all toned they're all toned down uh, yeah so but um, with uh, with color temperature, yeah, you, you generally want to unite 
your shadows and your highlights with a single color temperature. Um, and you don't... Sometimes you want them uh, to oppose each other. That can create interest. Uh, sometimes you don't want them to. Um, I suggest playing around uh, with things like that so that you can... Uh, I can, you can use all of that. All right. Oh, so moving on to Governor 5. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, I'm going to hide this temporarily. Oh, I've got all of this here. All right. Well, whatever. I'm going to write out my governor here anyway because it's my picture and I can do what I want. All right. Governor number 5 is... Avoid using, it's not a dominate this time, avoid using pure white. Why do you want to avoid using pure, pure white? Well, white is not really a color. It belongs on the value scale. Um, it doesn't really belong in any color and color theory uh, because it will supersede all other colors as the brightest thing on the page. And so we can see, like here on this, uh, in in this in this space where I'm using to demonstrate here, everything is kind of you know overpowered by this white color here. You know that's for contrast purposes, and we can make things easier to read by placing something black on a white background. Uh, I could have done the opposite by using using black, and I think this this rule can be can be um, can be extrapolated into using pure black as well. Because whenever you're using like the the pure whites and blacks, you you might be stealing a little bit of like, attention from the rest of your colors, right? So you know, thinking back to before when we had the rainbow here, we've got the rainbow here. If I'm hiding Mr. Stillfreeze for a little bit. We've got the, again, going back to we've got the, the rainbow here. None of this is like a pure white, right? Um, and and none of it's a, a pure black either. And whenever we throw this uh, color correction layer over it, it completely disappears. Our rainbow disappears. But, uh, uh, where was I going with this? Um, yeah, it, so whenever you're using like uh, a white thing, it can pull a lot of attention away from where you might want it to be. So like, oh, we've got white things here. They might be pulling our attention away from the other colors because we've got a pureness here. You know, sometimes you can use that intentionally. Like if you're using like a single white spot in an area of, of, of uh, these things, maybe the, maybe you want that attention somewhere. Um, but yeah, but generally, you know, you, you'll want to avoid that in, in, uh, at least in your, in your beginning practice of color theory. Try to avoid using strict white or strict black. Try to inject, you know, as much of this, like, middle gray area, uh, as possible into your colors. And you can use your shadows over here, your highlights over here, or whatever, you know. But, um, yeah, so, like, you, you don't want to pull the viewer's attention away from your subject, right? This is, like, bringing it back to, to, to these principles right here. It's all about controlling attention, right? So you want, to av you want to, like, control the way that you shift focus and control the attention for the viewer on the page. Because... You know, in, in, in all art, we definitely, we usually want attention to be on a limited number of spaces in the page. So it's either one thing, maybe two or three things, like to bounce between. Um, but usually there's like a single dominant uh, thing, so to speak. All right. So yeah. Uh, if, you're, if you're standing in a room lit by green lights and someone uh, holds up a white sheet of paper... Your perception of that green, of that light green, being white, justifies every other color in the room. If that sheet of paper actually appeared as white, then all the other colors in the room would look too green. Sometimes you get backed into a corner on this one. 
but even if you put just a little color in your white it helps it will look as though it is white if that color is the lightest value on the illustration so that's taking into example like things things that are lit in a certain color so yeah all right uh, those are the rules those are the governors that you need to keep in mind Apply the simple rules to any color scheme to create successful and stronger color compositions. Uh, and we can move on and we can talk about like uh, like uh, color themes, for example. But I want to give a, a brief pause here. Uh, are there any questions? Oh, I'm glad more people got came came and went. I guess. Thanks, people, for showing up. Just curious, do you have examples of where color feel is culturally, culturally dependent? You've never heard of it. Oh, okay. Uh, so, for example, right, um, white uh, in, in, in America, for instance, white is a color that has grown to symbolize, like, purity. Uh, so we, we dress our, our, our brides in white, you know, they're the ones that are, that are in white. Uh, and black is associated with mourning. Uh, in in there, there are other Asian cultures that have it the reverse way, where white is the color of uh, mourning clothes. When someone's died, you wear you wear white rather than black to a funeral or a or a whatever whatever their process is. Like you, looking up, you can look up color and and cultural cultural contexts of of colors. Uh, it's a it's a unique thing to to kind of look at, and it gives you kind of a different um, perspective, right? Because like if we've got you know purple, we can think of like as like a um, you, you can think of it in a variety of ways, right? So like if someone's uh, skin is turning blue or purple, that's not that's not at all a good thing. That can be something that shows you that that someone is very ill or very injured, right? But purple is also the color of uh, royalty. You know they died fabrics this this bright intense shade of, of purple and you know depending on the the culture that you're that you're raised in and can change what colors mean to you i hope that answers your question fish um but yeah definitely look into it it's a it's a neat thing to to look into yeah uh any other questions i'm gonna take a drink here real quick All right. Okay. So let me show you uh, if we're if we're done there. I can show you a couple of tricks actually. So let's go back to let's go back to our page here. I'm gonna hide the rest of that stuff. No, not that. One. We're gonna go back to. To this right all right so I was very clear to use like blacks here right because I was just laying stuff down if I drop the opacity of that some we get more of a more of a gray and this can instantly uh, be a little bit better as far as uh, as far as you know following rule number five about avoiding uh, pure white and black. I'm gonna erase this. Whoops. That's the wrong place. Haha. Uh -huh. Okay. So I want to return back to what I was um, what I was doing over over here, for example, when I was talking about uh, unifying colors, right? So we've laid this kind of like vague orange over the over the rest of this, right? Uh, something that you can do to help tie the colors like closer together. So like I used a bunch of like colors over here as well, right? So if I make a new layer, uh, and in Photoshop you can do like a fill layer right here. I'm just gonna do a a new raster layer, and I'm going to fill it with this 
single color right here. Now everything is one color, right? Uh, if I've put this over all of the rest of my colors, it has dominated every single other one, right? But if I start turning the opacity down, I can start seeing an image that is more or less united by this single color, right? Right now I have it at 35%. That's a very strong effect, you know? Usually if I'm trying a, a color uniting effect, it'll be more in the range of like 5 or 10%, right? This will be a very, very subtle difference, you know? So like I turn it, uh, so there it's off, right? And there it's on, right? It's a very, very small difference. But it brings the, it pulls the clo colors closer together. If you ever find that your picture is color discordant, like there's a little too much going on, this is one of the tricks that you can use is to, to choose uh, an overlay color that that uh, that you can kind of bleed into the rest of the colors to, to make it seem like they fit closer together. And again, you can use the trick of like the, the black and white to, to see the effect here too. Very subtle difference. So there it's on, there it's off, right? And so we lose maybe just a, a tiny bit of the value there. See, I'm using a, a 5%, and maybe maybe your, maybe your opinions are different. Maybe 5% is too strong. Maybe you want to take it down to 1% or 2%. You know, some, some images call for that. But yeah, so that's one of the ways to bring discordant colors together. Or maybe... Maybe they're not entirely discordant, uh, but they're not quite as unified as you might like them to be. So that's one way of doing that, is just throwing a layer over, a solid color layer over everything, and then reducing its opacity. Uh, or, or maybe even, uh, maybe you don't want to change its opacity, maybe you want to change the layer type. You can change it to darken, or uh, if, it's a, if it's a darker color. Or you can change it to uh, multiply... Uh, or screen. Screen will make things a bit lighter. So like there's a screen one and there's a normal one. I didn't see a lot of difference there. But yeah. So you can change your layer type if you don't want it normal. But that's that's one of the ways that I that you can that you can kind of pull pull t colors together. All right. Um Let's see here. Yeah, I've been going for about an hour. Uh, any any more questions? All right. Uh, got nothing. Okay, that's okay. That's okay. If no one has questions, if you have questions later. Uh, and this will go to, you know, you, you guys that I'm addressing right here in the stream. Uh, and this will go to, like, viewers on YouTube as well. Like, if you're not part of the our Furry Art School Discord, I don't know what you're doing watching this video. Like, come join. You know, I'm here. Um, ask me questions. You know, if you're viewing one of my videos, come here and ask me questions. I've got uh, I've got comments turned off cause on my YouTube videos because I'm, I'm kind of uh, sensitive to, like, the, the abuse of uh, of something, but uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm a little too sensitive to that. But like, if you want to ask ask me questions, like you can send me direct messages via Discord. Um, yeah, I'm also available on Telegram frequently, or you my fur affinity page or whatever. If you've got questions, I will answer them. So reach out to me. Uh, if something about these videos confuses you, reach out to me at any time. But yeah, so that is going to that is going to wrap up this this uh, art art lecture stream, so to speak. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yourselves a lot. I uh, I hope you learned a couple things. For those of you who came in late, it's totally okay. I do record these for a reason. I put them up on YouTube. So yeah, uh, you're absolutely cool to to go and catch the beginning of that. Um, again, I drew a lot of the content from this uh, conversation from Brian Stelfreeze. Check him out. Uh, absolutely fantastic comic book artist. Um, yeah, great. Uh, to our 
to our stream attendees. Uh, feel free to hang out afterwards. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a break, but we can just hang out and draw, and I can continue to answer questions or offer critiques on pieces you might have. Uh, but yeah, to our YouTube audience, thank you for watching. Uh, hit like and subscribe or, or whatever if you are so inclined. Uh, it uh, it helps helps my channel out. Uh, thank you very much. Um, oh yeah, and uh, also from uh, from last time, I've got uh, I've got a PayPal tip jar. If you're at all interested in con contributing, uh, yeah, had a contributor to that last time. Super thankful and grateful for that. Thank you so much um, for your support. Uh, if not, you know, thank you for watching the video. Thank you for attending the stream. It's uh, it's just it's nice to know that I'm being useful to someone. All right. Um, yeah, that's it for the recording. I'm going to end that now. Feel free to hang out afterwards, though. All right. Bye, YouTube.